so uh, when I was six years old, I remember helping my father load a pickup truck with trash bags full of junk, old clothes, and broken toys. It was a 20-minute drive just east of town, and after arriving, we backed up to the edge of the dirt road and started heaving trash bags over the tailgate and onto the ground. We were at the local landfill. Now, the Barkhamstead New Hartford Landfill in Northwest Connecticut opened in 1973, and it took only 10 years before state inspectors discovered that toxic chemicals were contaminating the local water supply because the landfill was never designed with a liner at the bottom. But I remember staring there out over the man-made mountain of trash, overwhelmed, because this was where the products of consumerism went to die. I stood there for what seemed like 10 long minutes, watching as a line of large machines backed up to the edge of the road, just like we did, and then opened their mouths and vomited their contents onto the ground. Now, the last 150 years of industrial evolution has been about maximizing throughput across a linear, take-make-waste economic model from extraction to landfill, extraction to landfill. Only a fraction of materials are actually recovered and retained in the flow of commerce. Two-thirds of all materials in the United States end up in one of these two places, either buried in a hole in the ground or burned and put into our air. So what's the problem? Well, there are two problems. The first and most significant is that we haven't been paying the real cost of production in terms of ecosystem degradation, pollution, resource depletion, or toxification. Some estimate that more than 60% of global ecosystems have been severely degraded from current and past economic activity. Resources are dwindling, we're in the middle of a mass extinction of species, and economic volatility is at all-time highs for a number of reasons, including scarcity and the effects of climate change. Now, economists are warning us that two and a half to three billion new middle-class consumers are going to enter the market in the next 10 to 15 years from India and China, each of them with disposable incomes and aspiring to Western consumption levels. Now, the second problem is that we haven't paid enough attention to the chemistry of the materials we're putting out into the world. And since we're depleting resources so quickly, we've started to recycle more. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Well, let's consider this. Nearly 300 million tires in the United States are scrapped every year. And tires are designed for high-performance applications on automobiles. But they also happen to contain a whole range of toxic metals and organic compounds with well-known health hazards. Now, someone along the way thought it would be a fantastic idea to shred these things and spread them out over children's playgrounds. But tires were never designed with children in mind. Tires were never designed for children to play on, rub all over their skin, are breathing the gases coming off of them in the afternoon sun. What about our homes? Well, below the carpet in your home sits recycled foam padding. The, re the remnants of used furniture and mattresses crammed into one more product. It also happens to be one of the primary sources of flame retardants in your body, toxic chemicals linked with organ failure, cancer, and birth defects. The padding is recycled garbage, now leaking chemicals into the home. How sad is it when consumer products have become the modern-day landfill. And if we aren't toxifying each other, the soil or the air, we pollute our waterways, our oceans, rivers, and streams. And wildlife often mistake this for food. A lot of waste and debris floats on water. Uh, birds will even swoop out of the sky and consume these things. And now we're finding dead birds littering our coasts. They're, fragile, they're fragile skeletons encasing a gut full of discarded bottle caps and plastic waste. Meanwhile, corporate profits have soared to record highs, and the reason for not changing, the reason for not investing in a better future, we're told, is, well, we don't have the money. We can't afford it. We can't sacrifice profit. Why is that? Well, businesses are accountable to investors. But I'm an investor. All of you are investors. Doesn't it make you wonder what we've been investing in? I think we've reached a point where we have to start asking ourselves some very tough questions about the prosperity of this economic model. Are we more prosperous now that there's a 50% chance of getting cancer? Do we really prosper when we destroy our oceans, slash and burn our forests, or toxify the planet? Are we really prosperous? Do we really prosper by increasing shareholder value at the expense of our health and well-being? I'm a chemist and engineer, and I've been asking myself these questions. I've spent the last eight years studying materials and industrial systems, particularly at the intersection of people, economies, and ecology. And I've had a very rare privilege of being able to review hundreds of confidential formulations from the world's chemical companies. 
They're secret recipes for plastics, paints, coatings, adhesives, you name it. And I have to tell you, I am shocked at what we allow in products today. So these experiences have shaped my motivation because I believe we can do better. I believe that we can design and create profitable, sustainable enterprise that doesn't toxify our air, water, soil, food supply, or the products we use every day. I believe that we can restore our ecosystems and improve not only the health and well-being of people, but ensure the long-term health of business. We can't afford not to change. And with the rich history here in West Michigan of makers and innovators, we have an opportunity to create and adopt a new model, a model for change. So today I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about two things, how a circular economy and cleaner chemistry can be the vehicle to better business, a more vibrant West Michigan manufacturing sector, and a more prosperous world. Now, the first step in this process is to move away from the disposable society and into a circular economy. Now, a circular economy is restorative by intention and design, and the focus is on keeping materials flowing in commerce longer. So the foundation of economic growth, it's not based on the extraction of new resources. Instead, it's based on the reuse of materials already available to us. And at the design stage, products would be designed for the ease of reuse, disassembly, repair, refurbishment, and then kept in nice, tight, closed loops. Because at this stage of the game, we've already spent a lot of time, money, energy, resources, connecting these molecules and making these products. Reuse of these materials affords us tremendous savings in energy emissions, air emissions, or energy, air emissions, water emissions, and so on. But there's also a lot of money to be made here. There's a lot of uh, money to be made in new products, new business models, but the material cost savings alone is estimated at over $1 trillion. Now, some companies have found this to be a powerful framing condition for product and business model innovation. For example, last year I stumbled upon this. This is an ad from Patagonia, a very profitable company. Now, Patagonia asked their customers to connect with one another and sell used gear instead of buying new so that it stays in commerce longer. This is part of their Common Threads initiative. Now, Patagonia wants to be a, a model for designing and creating value that's restorative rather than damaging, because they realize their success, their ability to remain in business, means that they need to restore the literal and metaphorical fabric on which their livelihoods depend. Now, the result of this campaign for Patagonia has been increased brand value, deeper customer relationships, and a stronger market position. Now, the companies that have joined the CE100, the Circular Economy 100, have joined the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to accelerate a transition into the circular economy because they too realize their long-term interests lie not in the wasteful flows of the linear economy, but in bringing scale to new technology, closed-loop material flows, and implementing new business models. Now, some companies like Turn2 uh, has start, have started to create service models around what we would consider everyday products, from office furniture to carpeting, lighting fixtures, your chair. And then these companies arrange for pickup and recovery of materials and products so that they can be disassembled, refurbished, remanufactured, recycled. So the, actually, the next evolution in recycling might come from smart materials. Now, most products today are made for the ease of uh, manufacturing, the lowest cost, not for the ease of Re disassembly, reuse, repair, refurbishment. But researchers are working on smart materials that change shape when a stimulus is applied. So heat, ultrasound, electricity, even magnetism. So I'd like you for a moment, imagine products now with smart fasteners moving down a disassembly line. And as they pass through a magnetic field, they simply fall apart. So this could actually serve, this concept could serve to scale up disassembly in a really efficient and elegant way. But here's the catch. If we're going to do this, if we're going to keep materials flowing in commerce longer, we have to design those to be safe for human and environmental systems. Because we can't change the chemistry of products once we put them out into the world. Now, one study in 2005 found 287 man-made chemicals in fetal umbilical cord blood, from pesticides, flame retardants, and plasticizers. We are, quite literally, toxified before we enter this world. The Center for Disease Control has been tracking more than 200 high-volume production chemicals now found in us every day, many linked with ill health effects. And there are several studies on human breast milk. Women, your breast milk is so contaminated that it can't be sold on store shelves today. So we need to address product and material chemistry at the design stage with our suppliers, with the material manufacturers, so that we can eliminate chemicals of concern. We shouldn't be creating products that are linked with cancer or endocrine disruption or birth defects. 
We also need to eliminate chemicals out of our materials and products that, are, that pollute our air, water, soil, or accumulate in living things. Ultimately, designing for the future is going to require that we expand our value set. Rosabeth Moss Cantor once said that a vision of the future is not just a picture of what could be. It's an appeal to our better selves, a call to be something more. Let's decide today to create a vision of the future here in West Michigan that doesn't toxify our air, water, soil, the food supply, or the products we use every day. Let's decide today to leave the disposable economy behind, the disposable society behind, and step into a better future. But this is going to be different. I believe we can do better. This journey is going to require proactive thinking followed by innovative action. But we need to remember that innovation, it's not always about problem solving. It's also about opportunity finding. And the opportunity right here in West Michigan is to be a center for a new industrial revolution that creates economic value that's restorative through the circular economy. The opportunity is to, in our own businesses to begin enabling people to live healthier, happier, more fulfilled lives that support our world and future business in a sustainable way. So let's decide today, in the spirit of doing more good, that we're going to continue this conversation, not just here, but back in our own businesses, so that we can lockstep together into more profitable enterprise in a better world. Thank you.